Hi everyone, I'm Maddie. I'm Greg. And welcome back to my channel. Today we've got a real treat for you because we've come to the Horniman Museum in South East London to make not one, but four films for you. Actually five, including this one. Yes, very true. Five, including this one. The Horniman Museum is home to a whole collection of curiosities that were found and brought back to England 150 years ago by a Victorian explorer and tea trader called Frederick Horniman. So come on, let's go see what we can find. This is the Natural History Gallery. It's full of amazing taxidermy. Including this guy, the giant Horniman walrus. Right, mate. <laughs> and this is the Music Gallery, which has over a thousand instruments from all over the world on display. There's also an aquarium full of lots of different displays. This is our favourite, the Fijian Coral Reef. But this is the room that we're going to be exploring for our new series of films. Welcome to the Robot Zoo, where amazing animals have been recreated in robot form to help us understand how they work. We are going to make a series of films, each one focusing on a different animal and a different curious question. How does a grasshopper jump so high? Why is it so hard to catch a fly? How does a chameleon change colour? And how does a bat see in the dark? The best way to make sure that you can see every film as soon as we put it live is to hit the subscribe button. Stay curious because we're going to see you very soon. Today we're going to jump right in because we're talking about grasshoppers. Did you know that grasshoppers, they make that chirping sound by rubbing their back leg against their front wing? It's called stridulation, by the way. <laughs> but that's not what this film is about. Today, we want to find out what makes grasshoppers such amazing jumpers. He's off. If a grasshopper was the same size as me, it would be able to jump over the museum's roof and make it across a full-size football field in three jumps. So how does a grasshopper jump so high? We're going in there to find out. We're at the Robot Zoo in the Horniman Museum in London and this giant robotic grasshopper is going to help us answer this curious question. All right, Mads, introduce us to him. Right, okay, so take a look at this. A grasshopper has six legs, two wings, and small pincers that help it to tear its food, things like leaves and grass. But there's also something really cool about a grasshopper. Now, unlike us humans who have our skeleton, that's our bones, inside our bodies, a grasshopper, because it's an insect, has its bones on the outside of its body. It's called an exoskeleton, and all of its organs and muscles are inside that exoskeleton. But let's take a look at the body parts that it really needs for jumping. Can you see how long this back leg is compared to this front leg? In fact, the back leg is about twice as long as this little front leg, and it's made up of different sections. We call this top part of the leg the femur. The bottom part of the leg the tibia and the foot is called the foot and it has strong claws to make sure it can grip onto the ground. To jump really high a grasshopper does three things. Now first of all this here is our grasshopper leg. Sure. Okay? <laughs> right so first the grasshopper will tuck its leg so that the tibia the lower part of the leg is flat against the ground. Then it pauses and then it pushes the lower leg, the tibia, off the ground, which fires the grasshopper into the air. But all that takes some serious muscle power. Inside the top part of the grasshopper's leg, inside that femur, if you looked underneath the exoskeleton, you'd see two really strong muscles, and they work together to move the leg. And what they can do is they can pull that 
tibia up. And when it's like this, it's actually squashing a spring, which suddenly releases, a bit like a catapult, and fires the grasshopper up into the sky. It is such a cool system. Actually, I don't think we're filming. Yeah, we are. Red light's on. Oh yeah. Sorry, I should probably wear my glasses. Oh, honestly, Greg, you're as blind as a bat. <laughs> Which is technically not true, because most bats aren't blind. They do have pretty poor eyesight, though. And for nocturnal animals... Those are animals that are active at night. Yeah, that's not a great thing, because you'd think they'll go around bumping into trees. Yeah, they don't do that. In fact, bats are so sure of where they're flying, they can avoid objects as thin as a human hair. So how do bats see in the dark? We're gonna go inside to find out. Yeah. Today we're at the Robot Zoo in the Horniman Museum because this giant robotic bat is going to help us answer this curious question. Go on then Mads, what have you found? Right, okay, so bats, like us, are mammals, which means they have hair all over their bodies to keep them warm, but they are the only flying mammals, and you can see their wings here, and their wings are made up of flexible skin that's stretched over long tubular bones, but... The key to how a bat sees in the dark is held here, in its head. And to find their way through the darkness, bats use something called echolocation. Now bats send out sound waves from their nose and their mouth. Those sound waves, just picture them as a really loud noise that's too high pitched for most humans to hear. Although interestingly, some children can actually hear the sounds that bats make. And those sound waves, they travel out and then they hit an object like a wall or a fly and they bounce back as an echo. You might have heard an echo before if you've ever shouted into a cave or a canyon. Hello! Hello. Hear that? Bats listen out carefully to these echoes with their enormous ears and depending on how far away it is, how loud the echo is or what direction it's coming from will give the bat all the information they need to know exactly what's going on around them. Oh, got a butterfly 13 feet away. What are you doing? This is a brilliant way to understand what echolocation is. So when I pull this trigger, uh, a burst of sound, of energy, gets fired out the front of my model bat here. And if I hit a target, it will bounce back and the detector will pick it up. So I can move it along until there. I've just hit the fly. So that sound has gone out, it's hit the fly, it's bounced back and the detector has picked it up. And just, oh, there it is. It's seven feet away, which is about two meters. And what's great is that by picking up this echo, we know the size of the object, the fly, the speed that the fly is traveling at, and then we can close in on it for lunch. Mads, they can't see us. What? I think, I think they, can, they can just see our heads. Oh yeah, they can just see our heads. That's because we're wearing cloaks that are the same pattern as the wall behind us, so we are camouflaged. Ooh. See? Look! Clever! <laughs> we are here at the Robot Zoo in the Horniman Museum to answer the question of how does a chameleon change colour? Uh, we're going to use this amazing robotic chameleon. Mads has run round. So chameleons are a type of lizard and they live in a whole range of habitats from deserts to rainforests and they have these parrot-like feet that help them to grip onto branches along with their wide, thick tail that they can wrap around sticks and twigs. But they've also got these funny, boggly eyes that allow them to look around in all directions. But what we're really interested in today is their ability 
to change colour. We should say that actually not all chameleons do change colour, but for the ones that do, why do they do it? You might have heard some people say that chameleons change colour to camouflage themselves against their background, just like we were doing earlier with the camouflage cloaks. And it makes sense because if a predator can't see you, if something that wants to eat you can't see you, that makes you safer. But actually, that's not the main reason. Chameleons change colour to communicate with each other and to control their temperature. Chameleons are cold-blooded, which means, unlike us, they can't heat themselves up to keep warm. So if they want to warm up, they have to absorb heat from the sun. And if they want to cool down, they need to find a way to get rid of some of that heat. And the easiest way to do that is to change the colour of their skin. So the darker a chameleon is, the more heat it will absorb, and the lighter a chameleon's skin, the more heat it will reflect, which will help them to cool down. So that's temperature, but how do they use colour to communicate? Well, when a chameleon gets angry, especially a male chameleon, it turns darker. I am so angry. <laughs> if a female chameleon is up for a date and wants to show off a little bit to a male chameleon, she'll get all colourful and crazy, like a party's going on. Disco chameleon. <laughs> so that is why a chameleon changes colour, but we want to know how they do it. Yeah, and the way they do it is so cool. It's all down to the fact that they have different layers in their skin. The best way to think about it is in each layer of skin, they have cells that are like bags of paint, bags of pigment, different colours. The top layer of their skin is transparent, it's see-through. The next layer down has bags of pigment that are coloured red. And then it's yellow. Then it's blue. And then the bottom layer is brown. So all they need to do is make those bags of pigment bigger or smaller and you're going to see more or less of that colour. So if they are angry and they expand the red bags of pigment, they're going to appear more red. Wow, and if they want to be a disco chameleon and attract a mate, they're just going to mix it all up all over their skin. Yeah, but they do literally mix it. So if they open up the blue ones and the yellow ones, that mixes to make green. Very clever. Isn't it so neat? There is so much going on in a chameleon. It's awesome. Have you ever tried to catch a fly? Seriously, it's so difficult, no matter how much you sneak up on them, they'll always see you first. That is what this film is all about. We're going to tell you why it's so hard to catch a fly. I'm going to give you a clue. It's all in the eyes. Okay, well, I give up. Let's go inside to find out. Good plan. <laughs> We're at the Robot Zoo in the Horniman Museum to meet this giant robotic fly who's going to help us answer this curious question. Take us through it, Mads. Right, okay, so a fly has six legs, two wings, and it, can you believe that a fly tastes with its feet and it sucks up its food through something called a proboscis. It's this vacuum-like nozzle. But if you've ever seen a fly up close, you might have noticed its amazing eyes. Us humans have two eyes, but a fly has so many more than that. Each of these is called a compound eye, and it's made of thousands of tiny, small, individual eyes, each one called an omatidium. And that means that it sees the world in a very different way to us, and that's one of the main reasons it's so hard to catch a fly. We can move our eyes around like this, and that's because we have muscles attached to our eyes that pull them in all different directions. But flies don't have those muscles, so they can't move their eyes around. So how do they see when we try to creep up on them? Well, flies don't need those muscles because they have thousands of eyes that allow them to see all around them. In fact, they practically have 360 degree vision. There. 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 Yes. Now you might think it's going to be a bit weird to see so many views of the world at once, but actually it's not. You see a really crisp image. Put all those views together from all of those eyes and you get a really good picture of the world. But it's not just a fly's eyes that help it to avoid capture. Oh no, flies also have 
sticky pads on their feet. And this is what helps them to stick to ceilings and walls, just about anywhere that's out of your reach. And these sticky pads, they produce a sugar oil mix that acts like glue. So that is why it's really hard to catch a fly. Yep. <laughs> Make sure you subscribe to our channel for more videos just like this and click on that bell to get notified every time we post a new video. If you want to see another curious question answered from here at the Robot Zoo, click on the giant squid. <laughs> Stay curious and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.